Hey guys, welcome back. Of the last couple of days, we've touched on forbearance as well as what forbearance is, how it might affect your credit. So today, what I wanted to do is bring an expert in, somebody in the lending field who knows the process and can answer a lot of the questions that you guys are putting in the comments. Questions like, if I do a forbearance, how is it going to affect my credit? Am I going to be able to buy a home in six months? Those sort of things. In addition, we're going to touch on guideline changes, things that have recently happened with regards to the lending industry and how that might affect you as well as the forbearance. And then also touch on interest rates because, you know, three weeks ago, interest rates were really, really low. They shot up and now, you know, now they're back down to where they were, I think. So we're going to touch on that today. And uh, with that, uh, I'll introduce you guys to Josh Lewis, Bywise Mortgage, pretty much my go to locally. Uh, for for any lending needs, so Josh, let's let's jump into it for a minute. So you've seen the videos on forbearance. Um, you've touched on the topic uh, as well as created an awesome website, which you can talk about here in, in just a minute. But you know, the question I'm getting more so than anything else is, you know, lenders are telling me that this isn't going to impact my credit, right? If I do a forbearance, you know, Congress said, or the government, or, or whoever it was said, you know don't well, impact the the borrower's credit when when they do a forbearance so what's the truth let's, can, let's are, is this going to affect people can they refinance can they purchase in in 60 90 120 days it's it's almost easier to state what we do know um and then kind of expand from there so why do we have forbearance at, at all what why is it an issue right now so when this crisis started to kick off um one of the things the government did is rushed out really quickly and say we're going to require um, holders of all federally backed mortgages to offer forbearance of up to 12 months to uh, borrowers so and that's what they said before they passed anything so lenders rushed to meet sort of just verbal guidance. Hey, this is what you have to do. As part of the CARES Act, which passed, what, seven, 10 days ago, it's a $2.2 .2 trillion stimulus. The FHFA, which regulates all federally backed mortgages, issued guidance that says you have to offer uh, forbearance of up to 360 days to anyone who is suffering uh, a loss of income, either temporary or permanent, due to coronavirus. They okay, so let's stop you real quick. So, yeah. elaborate on a federally backed mortgage. Who, who does, what does that incorporate? Any loan um, that is guaranteed e either directly or indirectly by the government. So super simple ones, FHA, VA, and USDA, those are true government loan programs, truly 100% federally backed. Loans underwritten to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guidelines have a quasi-government guarantee also fall under that category. So that encompasses about 65, 70% of all loans um, in the United States. Now, if you fall outside of that, if you have a jumbo loan um, that was done to a local bank, um, a private money loan, it, they're not, they don't fall under those guidelines. Now, most loans held by major servicers, the servicer is not necessarily the lender, but the person you make your payments to every month. Most servicers are following the guidelines, whether they're federally backed or not. They're just not required to. So you're probably going to be eligible and offered a forbearance agreement. So the, the second piece that I like to talk about, and that is what, what is forbearance? Most people don't know what it is. So a forbearance is just an agreement that allows borrowers undergoing a temporary hardship to either have a reduction or elimination of their mortgage payment for the duration of the forbearance. So we're seeing a lot of information and guidance out there, um, people jumping on social media, realtors, lenders saying, it's this, it's that. There's not a lot of direct guidance. And the, the one big question that you had as part of the CARES Act, it literally says that lenders cannot have an adverse impact on your credit. Of, so the lenders of federally backed loans in the next 360 days, if they offer you a forbearance, they cannot report anything negatively to your credit. Now, um, a lender friend of ours sent one just this week. It was a major servicer. Um, and all it was was just a note on the credit report, loan in forbearance or forbearance agreement. Um, right. So it's there, a lender can know. So you're gonna ask another really important question here in a second, what does that mean? Um, but lenders will know you're in forbearance. So everyone's saying it's free money, you don't have to make your payment for up to a year, it's not gonna have an impact on your credit, and the government said they can't require you to prove your hardship. All you have to do is affirm that you're undergoing a temporary loss of income. All of that is true, but it's not free money. 
you will pay it back. Um, it's not without consequence. It will show on your credit report. Um, so it, it really is sort of your last line of defense. Obviously, if you have no money in the bank and no income coming in this month and you have to do a forbearance, then by all means, it's right for you. But if you have other options and other resources, it's absolutely not the first line of defense. Um, I have a friend we talked to this week. He's back east. He's with Wells Fargo. Big, huge servicer. Um, they don't want to run afoul of the government. He contacted them, said, hey, I want to know more about forbearance. Boom, they pushed the button. They gave him a forbearance agreement. He wasn't asking for it. He just They just gave it to him. So you'd say, okay, well, that's good. Well, he's not undergoing any loss of income. So he went to make his payment here on April 1st. And they're like, no, you're in forbearance. We can't accept a payment. So, so crazy so, stuff. So that was questions for me then. So one, the, the last one part was really interesting. But before that, I was going to ask you a question. And that is a lot of people are asking me, hey, look, what if I go to refinance in three months? Rates are down, you know, to mid twos at that point. I want to refinance my loan, but I did a forbearance. Can I refinance? The Based best, on current guidelines, we don't know what they are going to be. So the, the best answer today of what we know is if you are in a forbearance agreement, no, you cannot refinance. If you were in a forbearance agreement and you no longer are, then yes, you can. But remember, you had to affirm that you had a temporary loss, a permanent or temporary loss of income. So if you go to an underwriter two months from now and say, no, 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 that was then, this is now, they're going to go, cool, we'll prove it to me. Because two months ago, you told me you had a loss of income. Now we have to know why was that loss of income temporary and, and no longer permanent. So the answer is yes, you should be able to refinance if you're out of your forbearance agreement. So that again, we have so many questions here and so many directions you can go with this conversation. You're gonna say, okay, what does it mean to be out of a forbearance agreement? For the most part, we don't know. My buddy with Wells Fargo that is in a forbearance, he has not received his forbearance agreement. He doesn't know what that means other than he didn't have to make his April payment. So if you look, Wells Fargo is one of the better servicers. They've done a really good job on their website of saying what it is and what it means. They're saying 90 to 120 days, no payment, and they have not told anyone how you're going to repay the arrearages. So you, the, your worst case scenario, the worst thing that could happen is it's a 90-day forbearance. At the end of the 90 days is, okay, you skipped three payments. We got four payments due now. So if you couldn't make one payment and you had a reduction of income, it's really unlikely you really make four. Now, does that sound far-fetched and unrealistic? It does. I don't think it's going to happen. But it's what Bank of America, the first weekend of this crisis, was telling people they were going to have to do. It's not likely, but it could happen. Um, the other options are you can have, so it's either all due and payable at one time to be done with the forbearance, or you look at, we have an increase. Let's say you get $10,000 behind. They say, okay, we're going to increase $500 a month for 20 months till we get caught up that $10,000. The other option is, hey, we put $10,000 and tack it onto the end of the loan. Those are the three options that we have. Now, if we're asking again, can I refinance in three months? If I brought it current, yes, I can. Can I use the money from a cash out refinance to bring it current? Probably not. Um, and if you're if you're in a forbearance agreement that hey for the next 20 months I have an extra 500 bucks no you're still under that forbearance agreement so again like you said this is changing day by day we don't know for a fact what that's going to look like 90 180 360 days from now but what I can tell you right now is lenders are scared to death of the repercussions of a loan going into forbearance so the loans they made the last 5 10 15 years that's their responsibility the servicer that collects your payment is responsible so it's kind of important to let borrowers know nine times out of ten there's a servicer that you make your payment to that's not the person that owns your loan there's an investor that owns the loan somewhere and they get the interest payment the servicer so called into that video here in the corner where you guys can learn more about that so perfect so the, the servicer collects your monthly payment they get to keep a service fee for it they send a little bit of a guarantee fee to Fannie Mae Freddie Mac whoever's guaranteeing the loan and then the rest goes on to the investor so when you're looking at that the servicer is responsible for making those payments to the investor whether you make them or not so they had accounted for what's what's the possibility you know I talked to one of our, our big servicers um, uh, just two weeks ago they said prior to uh, to the middle of March they had less than one percent default rate they had two people in their their loss mitigation department two total employees they got 1200 calls the day before that 
two people can't handle 1200 calls. And now remember the people that are in loss mitigation, most likely a month ago, they weren't in loss mitigation because that department was two people and they're working from home. So imagine at your work, if you had to hire a hundred new employees, have them work from home and train them to do a job they didn't know how to do. When you're calling and asking about forbearance, the person you're talking to probably doesn't know a lot more than you. Their supervisor knows what is current as of today. So anyone that jumps on social media on any of these videos and is telling you, hey, these are the definitive answers, do this today because you know, that's why I'm telling everyone, be cautious. If you're painted into a corner and you have no other options, do what you have to do, but be cautious with this because there is going to be repercussions. Yeah. And and in in that video that I mentioned that I'm going to post, you know, I talked about why a lot of these lenders, these servicers aren't giving you your best options because they're on the hook for the difference if if you're not able to make your payment and they have to pay the investor. So, you know, they're giving you the least amount of flexibility that they can possibly give you at this point. To, to at least meet some guidelines from, from the government to give you that forbearance. So they're not going to come out and say, hey, look, we're, we, you can miss your payments for a year. They're going to say, hey, look, let's review it in three months. Let's review it in six months because yep. they want that money back as quickly as possible because otherwise they're in a position where, you know, they don't have those funds on their balance sheet. They, you know, this is money that they have to spend. So unless the, you know, there's another stimulus to back these guys, this creates a whole nother world that we won't, you know, that'll take this conversation down a, a really deep rabbit hole we don't have time for. So, uh, but one thing you mentioned I thought was really enlightening and something that people should know is that you said if you're in forbearance and you go to make a payment, that there's a chance the lender, the servicer is not going to accept that. I've had many, many of you guys who've watched, are probably watching this video and have commented on the video, even friends that have gone into forbearance. They said, hey, look, I did the forbearance agreement, but I think I'm, I'm going to be able to make my, my April payment or my May payment. <laughs> if that's the case, you should have a conversation with your lender again to make sure you're clear on what you can and cannot do. And if you're in a position where you can make that payment, you want to make sure you call your lender and have yourself removed from any forbearance while you still can, because otherwise you're going to might be putting yourself in a bad position. Now, so- clearly... As, as, as you mentioned, Josh, this stuff changes so rapidly, you know, I mean, honestly, like hourly, it, it changes. And so, you know, having those conversations, staying up to date, you know, communication with your lender is the key to this whole thing. So this and, is the and, thing. And, uh, you, yeah, you, you you had teased that um, that we have a resource. So I'm going to put this up here. ForbearanceReport.com. My business partner, Scott Shang, and I have created this um, tool. It's a full website. It has links to all servicers. Um, there's a comment section in there where you can ask questions or tell us what you know and what your experience has been when you call your, your servicer. Um, it has a full FAQ of all of the things we're talking about and way even more in depth. But most importantly, it's not a static website it's going to be a dynamic document because like I'm saying, I can tell you everything I know today. I'm going to know more a week from now, more a month from now, more 90 days from now. So that website will be a current resource of up-to-date information of letting you know. And hopefully it's a dynamic thing where um, folks that we're talking to and people around the country can say, this is what happened with Wells. This is what happened with Chase. This is what happened with HomePoint because it's going to be different. um, and, And we want to get accurate answers to people. No, I think that's awesome. So if you guys are, you know, asking additional questions about forbearance that we haven't touched on, or, you know, you're looking to contact your lender or servicer, most of these guys now have a website uh, dedicated to this sort of thing. And so what you're able to do is is go to um, forbearancereport.com and link to your servicer. And again, if it's if your service is not on there, make sure you reach out to them so they can add it. And that way you can stay current on that information. So um, you know, I'm not going to dive in, any deeper into that, but let's take a minute and talk about guidelines, right? So a lot of you guys have, have asked about buying, about, you know, you know, you have a house on the market, you're going to be in the market in the next 30, 60 days. What's changed with regards to, to lending guidelines? Now, I know one of the things that have changed with regards to verification of employment, and I'm sure you're probably going to touch on that, but I know there's some other things as well. The, the two biggest things, um, verifications of employment and age of documentation. 
So in normal times, you can have documentation that's 120 days old in the file. And what do we mean by normal times? Times where the stock market is flat or for the last 10 years has been inching upwards. So a lender doesn't really care whether we have the most recent um, 401k statement because we know it was better than what happened three, four months ago. So right now, the guidance is 60 days, pretty much across the board, Fannie, Freddie, FHA, VA. The reality is most lenders want your absolute most current statement. So if right. the statement was three weeks old, they're going to go, cool, we have the most recent recent. If they have one that's five weeks old, they're going to go, well, you should have got one a week ago. I want to see what that is. So right. just count on if you're in process and it takes more than 30 days, you're probably going to update documentation at the end so that the lender knows, hey, we have a current pay stub to prove a pay stub came in last week, two weeks ago, whenever. Um, and then you're going to have your asset documentation current up to date and showing current balances. So a, a second piece of that. So the verification of employment, we typically, about 10 days uh, before closing is about when your documents, your loan documents usually go out. So as part of that process of preparing and sending loan documents, um, lenders do a verbal verification of employment. So it's not your full verification of employment. They did that earlier in the process. They just make a phone call and say, hey, does Jeb still work there? Cool, Jeb still works. We got a job and we'll move forward. Now that needs to be within 48 hours of the note. So everyone almost across the board, we're a broker. We have 20 different lenders that we work with. What I'm seeing is within 24 hours of preparing those loan documents, they want a verbal verification. Now think about that. Not only are you and I working primarily from home, 90% of people are, that means their HR department, the person that would normally do their verification is sitting at home on their couch and difficult to get a hold of. So it's making things really hard. If you're in process and getting a loan, whether it's a refinance or a purchase, know towards the end who's going to do your verbal verification of employment, get a phone number, and even better yet, an email address, because we don't normally accept that. But currently they're saying if someone has a work work email address and can give contact information to say, yes, Jeb still works there. This is from my email. This is who I am. That will work as well. So and, and I'll give you a, a really good uh, uh, example of this is, is I had a buyer that's supposed to close next, uh, next Wednesday or next Thursday and loan docs went, uh, loan docs were supposed to come out this week. She's a flight attendant, Delta. And uh, the lender that's doing her, her, her loan, um, was a friend of hers, but he was sending, he was brokering the loan through UWM and they require verification of employment um, when those docs go out. And uh, because she's a flight attendant and currently on temporary leave because she was um, exposed to the coronavirus, to COVID-19, she had to be on quarantine for a couple of weeks. Well, during that time, she was on a temporary leave. She's not supposed to start back until May 1st which her first paycheck is not going to be until mid May. And so this created a whole different issue. So she ended up having to do a hard money loan in order to get the funding so that we didn't lose uh, the house and she could still move forward. And she's going to have to refinance in three, four months down the road to, you know, to get back into a, a normal conventional loan. But, you know, she had to go take something that she wouldn't have normally had to do because of these new guideline changes. So, I mean, it, it's really affecting people. I mean, it's not just, hey, look, we've made a, a minor change and you're not going to be affected. Chances are, you know, especially in an industry where, you know, if you're in a restaurant in any service related industry and, and, and airlines, you, you don't know about employment at the moment. So, yeah. Um, and Here's, here's another thing that I follow up with. I know that none of the, the smart, wise, beautiful, intelligent people that would be watching this video would be one of these people. But about once or twice a month, I'll talk to someone uh, that wants a loan. And you can tell that they think they're only going to dole out bits and pieces of information and frame their package as well as possible. And you won't find out. You're not going to. I'm really good at answering questions. And if somehow it gets past me and I don't ask it, the underwriter is going to ask it. So the best way to have problems at the end of a transaction is to think that you're going to frame your picture in a certain way that the underwriter only sees what you want them to see. Um, I have a borrower, really smart guy, um, and he tells me, um, I lost my job, but it's okay. As soon as the, the stay at home order is over, I'll be back on the job and they're paying me through the end of the month. So let's just get this going really quick and get it done. Well, two problems. You're not gonna get loans done in 21 days in the current environment. And the second piece of it, even if you did, they're gonna make a phone call at the end and go, is Lewis still working? His thought was, hey, here's a pay stub. 
uh, and I'll have that another pay stub through the process. It just doesn't work that way. Lenders are very smart. Um, we get, you know, I've done this for 25 years. 25 years ago, you could get away with some crazy stuff and you could, you know, frame things. It does. It just doesn't happen anymore. There's two, everything's online. Everything's in databases. Everything can be verified. No. Awesome. So great information. And then lastly, I teased interest rates at the front of this. Um, what are we looking at now with regards to rates? What do you think is going to happen over the next three, six months once some liquidity comes back to the market, once this COVID-19 thing is somewhat under control? So here's the crazy thing. Um, if I showed you a chart of mortgage bonds right now, mortgage bond prices are at all time highs, which should mean yields are inverse to that. So interest rates should be lower than they've ever been. Um, we're very close to the all time lows on standard balance loans. So you and I are here in Orange County, California, 75, 70% of loans are high balance loans. What does that mean? So the government sets guidelines saying um, your normal Fannie Mae Freddie Mac limit is $510,400. If you go above that, we'll still do the loan up to one and a half times that, so 765, 600. Um, but high balance, they put restrictions on it. And the most important one is lenders are not supposed to make more than 10% of their loans as high balance loans. Well, there's been so much volume in the high balance that no one wants them right now. So what does that mean in terms of interest rates? We did see rates continue to improve. Rates, it's, it's funny, I say rates in air quotes because um, they don't, there's not really a consistent across the board rate. If you need a standard balance loan, non-high balance rates are amazing. Best qualified borrowers, 3.375, 0%. You know, a month ago, we were maybe at three and a quarter with zero points on that, but that was for a day or two before everything blew up and went sideways. Now we flip over, we need a high balance loan. That same perfect gold plated borrower needs a $600,000 loan. They can have two options. They can get the same 3.375, but instead of the zero points, they're paying one and a quarter points. So on your $6,000 loan, $600,000 loan, a $7,500 origination fee, not a small amount, or they can go all the way up to, to 4%. Those are their, their two options. That's a pretty big uh, spread. Normally we see about an eighth. If, if the, if the 3.375 is your standard balance rate, you're at three and a half on the high balance. Well, right now it's 4%. And that moderated a little bit from Thursday. So that's the thing I tell everyone. Um, don't think that the numbers I or anyone else told you a day or two days ago matter because rate sheets are totally decoupled from what's happening in the, the mortgage bond market. Mortgage bonds have been really stable the last 10 days or so and going higher in price, which would be lower in rates. Rate sheets are all over the place. We'll see a day where mortgage bonds improved, rates should be better, yet rate sheets are worse. So it's largely due to weird things where lenders have way too many high balance loans, so they don't want them right now. And loans across the board, they're being very cautious because like we touched on earlier, if you get a loan and and you ask for forbearance next month, they're on the hook for making those payments to the, the servicer and the investor. So they're fine with everyone that they did loans for in the past. They're just saying, I don't want to do any loans for anyone that, that is also going to add to my burden right now. So um, expectation going forward, I don't know that things are going to be any different a week or two from now. In three weeks, uh, two months, six months, rates will be lower than they are today. So right. anyone that's asking me, if we look at it and say, well, then does that mean that I should wait? I would not say that. If you have a standard balance loan, the numbers make sense today. If you have a need to take cash out, even on a high balance, and the numbers make sense today, do it because we're likely to see at least temporarily some hits to values. So you could have right. more restrictive appraisals in terms of the value that comes in, loan to value that lenders will allow. And then we don't know what guidelines are gonna look like. Most of these loan guideline changes should absolutely be temporary, but you never know. If this stretches out and we're on stay at home orders through June, July, this is going to be restrictive for a, a while. So burden the hand. I mean, rates are really good right now, especially for standard balance loans, and it changes every day. So stay in touch with your lender. If you have someone you know, like, and trust, just stay in touch with them on a day-to-day -day basis. As soon as you know you're moving forward, lock the loan as soon as you know the numbers make sense and, and don't worry about it. There's too much volatility, too much change from day to day to sit here and think that you're going to time the market because the smartest money in the business has no idea what's happening on rate sheets tomorrow. Right. And, and I'll elaborate on that in just a moment too. I mean, clearly I'm not in that in that world, but if you're considering re refinancing or, or whatever, get your documentation to a lender, to whoever it is you trust it and let them get the paperwork done. And that way when the rates do drop, 
you're in a position to lock that rate and you're not behind the eight ball, if you will, then trying to send in your documentation and, and locking the loan while everybody else is trying to do the exact same thing. Because otherwise, you're going to probably be in the same position people were a month ago where, you know, they couldn't lock it. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, rates were higher. Not to say that that's going to happen this time, but better to be safe than sorry. So essentially, we just call it our reservation list. I've got about 30 people on there right now that we were talking to going back and forth. And then everything went haywire and chaos. And most of them are high balance loans. So it doesn't make sense today, but it's going to. Rates are going to go lower. That will ease in normal. So what we're doing is gathering all of the documentation. We'll have to update. Uh, uh, pay stub and assets, but at least we have last two years tax returns, W-2s, whatever we need, everything's in that file. And most importantly, I can just price everything. I can go through those 30 every day and go, does this make sense today? Does this make sense? We picked up three of them this week that didn't make sense last week that makes sense today. And, and it's just quirks of the market. One lender gets hungry and, and offers a great term on what they're looking for on a day-to-day -day basis. So absolutely just be in a position when the market presents the opportunity and don't be greedy. If it, Meaning don't hold out thinking you're going to find the absolute lowest day in interest rates. Um, get a, a loan that makes sense for you that's at a, a low cost, a fair price and a good interest rate and just lock it in and move forward. No. Awesome. So, you know, I'm going to end it there. I, you know, I appreciate you guys watching, but before we do it, Josh, if somebody wants to reach out to you to ask additional questions, I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to tell them where to find you. Uh, but for all of you guys out there watching, if you have additional questions, do me a favor, comment below, ask them below. You know, myself or Josh will will answer them for you and get back to you with the answer. And honestly, if there's more videos you want to see on this, if there's a topic that we haven't covered that you want more information on, leave that as well. Or contact myself and or Josh, and he's going to give you his info now to do that. A thousand percent. The best way for us to know what videos to record, what interviews to do with each other, what we want to talk about is hearing from you guys what you want and need to know in the current market. So I've got a neat little trick here. I will throw up all my contact info uh, on the screen. Um, call or text the office number there. Uh, shoot me an email. Um, even if it's just a second opinion. I mean, we've done that a bunch here of just saying people are like, oh, I'm not sure this sounds like I should be getting a better deal than this. And you look at it and you're like, no, your person's doing a really good job for you. Um, so it's not a matter of, hey, we're trying to take someone else's business. A lot of times it's just good to have a second expert set of eyes on it to say you're in a good position. And that goes for the forbearance stuff also. If you're considering a forbearance, if they're throwing out options to you, if you have questions, reach out. Um, you know, We're obviously not going to make any money off of that. But what we do make money off of is keeping people in homes um, with, with good credit records. So anything we can do to, to help with that, um, we're, we're always available. No. Awesome. So Josh, dude, appreciate the uh, taking the time as always. And, um, you know, we'll do it again soon for sure. No, thanks Thank for having well. us. I appreciate it. All right, bye.